Okay. All right. So I'm, I'm Megan Bailey. I'm the other uh, Parkinson's disorders uh, specialist here at uh, Novant Neurology. Uh, for those of you who don't know me. So like I said, today, we're going to talk a little bit about marijuana and Parkinson's disease. So a few years ago, there was a video that was spread pretty widely online with this man who took a compound that we don't really know what it was. He was having a lot of dyskinesia. Um, he took something. He said it was a medical marijuana compound. We don't know exactly what it was. And then his dyskinesia is calmed down. So I got a lot of questions about this when this video first came out. Um, you know, what was he taking? Can I have medical marijuana? Uh, but the problem with this is that it's one person, it's one person's experience, and we don't know what exactly he took. So this is why marijuana is a little bit tricky to talk about in specific diseases, because we don't have a lot of information about it yet. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do know, okay? So this is just another um, group of interest. This is a child with epilepsy. Um, she has a disorder called Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. And Charlotte's Web was a specific type of marijuana strain that was used that had a lot of CBD in it or cannabidiol. Um, CBD is really popular now. You can buy it at the you know, gas station, basically. You can get it anywhere. Um, but in patients with this specific type of epilepsy, um, parents were actually purchasing this compound online and giving it to their kids and their seizures were significantly improving. So a pharmaceutical company actually took this compound, they have uh, formulated it in a way that children with epilepsy can take and it actually is on the market. So some of these things actually have moved forward, where we have found that specific compounds from marijuana plants have been helpful in specific groups. And so we are moving forward this information, but it's just, it's taking some time. So marijuana um, is from a, it's, it's cannabis basically, is the plant that marijuana is derived from. But we usually call it marijuana, which is the, the, the compound that we use uh, for the psychoactive properties. So it comes specifically from the flower. However, the leaves and the resinous extract of the plant can also be consumed. So it's been around for a very long time, right? There's hemp and then there's the marijuana plant, which we use for its psychoactive activities, but it's been around since 8,000 BC. There's been some evidence that it was used for hemp at that point. Um, its medical use was in China in 2700 BC. Uh, and it's just been continuously consumed throughout basically human history. Um, in 1996, its use became legal uh, in California and Arizona for medical purposes. And then since that time, we've kind of seen um, a change in popular opinion about marijuana being more acceptable to use in general populations for medical reasons and also for recreational reasons. So, um, like I said, it's been years, used for nearly 5,000 years in Chinese and Indian cultures. Um, after the fifth century, it was brought over to Persia and Arabia, and Napoleon actually brought it over um, from Egypt, uh, and it was widely used in Western cultures. Um, it was used medicinally until the 1900s, but then its popularity began to diminish um, due to other drugs being introduced to the market for similar pain and sedative purposes. So things like aspirin and barbiturates were actually used for pain instead of things like medical marijuana. So its, it's use became less popular. Um, then it became really difficult to obtain because there was this legislation that was passed called the Marijuana Tax Act uh, in 19, 1937 and then uh, public opinion about the use of the drug really declined. Um, and you, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Reefer Madness, but it really became kind of um, very unpopular to use marijuana at that period of time. So in the 1970s, it was labeled as a schedule one drug. So that's um, the Controlled Substance Act, which designated it as having no medical no medical use at all. So it's in the same uh, group as things like heroin and um, you know uh, psilocybin, things that we you know we don't really use for medical purposes. Um, because of this restriction, the study of marijuana has been really really hard, and that's why we don't have a lot of information about what marijuana can be used for. Was because the federal government has labeled it as being no medical use at all. 
So like I said, Schedule 1 drugs include heroin, LSD, mescaline, quaaludes, peyote, and marijuana. So it seems a little strange that marijuana would be in this class. And I think President Biden just announced that they're going to try to get marijuana out of the Schedule 1 class so that it can be used. Um, and maybe perhaps in the future, federally, it will be legal to study this drug. Uh, and to use it for other purposes. So schedule two drugs, which are things that we do use for certain reasons, um, but they're controlled are things like methamphetamine. So patients with ADHD take methamphetamine, um, other pain medications like Oxycontin Dilaudid. So it would be great if we could move marijuana into the schedule two so that we could study it and we could also prescribe it for patients. So like I said, medical marijuana um, has been available in 38 states now and DC, uh, and it's now used for specific medical conditions. Now it's a little tricky because we don't have a lot of studies to suggest this. So this, these lists of ailments that medical marijuana can be prescribed for, most of them have zero medical evidence. We're just giving patients the access to marijuana and we don't really know what it's doing. So that's why doctors are a little bit hesitant to actually give you the prescription for medical marijuana. In North Carolina, it's not legal, unfortunately, not medical marijuana, not recreational marijuana, but in other states, you know, your doctor can fill out a piece of paper and you can get access to medical marijuana. And then in 19 states now, recreational marijuana is actually legal. So North Carolina is a little behind the times. <laughs> so. So when I used to practice in Illinois, this was the list of all of the reasons why you could get medical marijuana. So there were just so many things that you could get medical marijuana for, and maybe three of these actually have medical evidence. We don't really know who came up with these lists. They didn't ask the doctors. They just come up with these lists. And then patients who have any of these. Hmm? There's very few. So the, let's see, so Tourette syndrome has some evidence, multiple sclerosis has some evidence, um, uh, patients with AIDS because of, they, they don't, they lose a lot of weight, so marijuana can help with that. So there are a few things that we do have a lot of evidence to support it. Parkinson's disease is not one of those diseases yet. So we're hoping that in the future we'll be able to study it, but like right, I said right now, because it's illegal, Federally, it's very, very hard for us to study. Dystonia, flat on the dystonia is can be part of Parkinson's disease. You can have dystonia with Parkinson's, but dystonia is a separate disease. So you can have dystonia without Parkinson's disease, but patients with Parkinson's have a higher increased risk of getting dystonia. Okay. So the main interest that we have in marijuana are these chemical compounds called cannabinoids, okay? There are 420 chemicals in marijuana. So it's not very simple for us to just study marijuana itself because there's so many chemicals. So what exactly are we looking at when patients smoke marijuana and they feel improved? We don't know because we have not been able to get really into the nitty gritty science-based backing of this, of the marijuana. We don't know what exactly is working. So... The differences in the chemical structure account for the differences in what people feel when they take different things. So why does this stuff work in our body? Well, we actually have an endocannabinoid system. So we have an area of our brain that is stimulated in a different way than other, other things, completely different things in our brain. So like dopamine works on a dopamine receptor, THC and CBD actually work on these endocannabinoid receptors. So this wasn't discovered until the 80s. And we have two main receptors in the body. So there are CB1 receptors or cannabinoid receptor one, which is in the brain and the spinal cord, and then cannabinoid receptor two, which is also located mostly throughout the rest of the body, but also in the central nervous system. So when we talk about receptors, it's kind of like a lock and a key. So the receptor is like the lock and the ligand or the chemical that we're putting into our bodies is like the key. So um, the receptor is always in the brain and then the key sometimes gets to unlock that lock. So when we talk about dopamine, there's a receptor that dopamine kind of locks into and then opens up that receptor to send the chemical signal. And it's the same thing with this endocannabinoid system. There's a very specific lock that goes with the key. So only certain things can actually activate that system. So that's why marijuana works in our bodies because we have a specific lock that the key will open and send the signal. 
So there are two transmitters that our body actually makes that activates this system. So there's anandamide and then 2-AG. It's arachidonyl glycerol, so I'll just call it 2-AG because it's a big word. But these basically act to inhibit other neurotransmitters in our neurons. So they're quickly made and they're quickly deactivated. So that's why we don't get high when these things are activated in our brains because they're just quickly made and quickly destroyed. So um, like I said, these receptors are really made in our bodies to be activated only very briefly. They're not meant to be activated prolonged periods of time. So what does this system do in our body? Well, it helps with memory. Um, it helps with mood. It helps with motor control. Uh, with eating, with pain, and also in children, they have a really robust system. It helps with neurodevelopmental development, uh, nervous system development in kids. So this is our brain, and the purple spots are all the areas where you can find the endocannabinoid system. So when you're putting marijuana into your body, this is all of the areas that it can potentially bind to. So it's everywhere in the brain. It's not one specific spot. Right, so this is what we're looking at when we actually, um, when we're talking about the endocannabinoid system and what marijuana is actually activating. So it's not so simple though, because like I said, there are these, these two different systems when they're activated by different drugs, they may do completely different things and we just don't know until we study them. So Marinol, which is a CB1 um, agonist, it induces hunger. But then there was another drug that was, um, that was manufactured called uh, Ramonabont, which blocks the CD1 receptor, it caused weight loss and anxiety. So, you know, they thought that it would help and it actually hurt people. So, you know, like I said, this is really hard to study these receptors because we just, we don't know as much about them as we would like to. So moving on to dopamine in the brain. So this is what we are all interested in Parkinson's disease is dopamine. So there are three different systems in the brain where dopamine is important. So the one that we are all interested in is the nigrostriatal system, which is the light blue. I don't know if this will work, but that's the light blue one at the top number one. That's the nigrostriatal system. So that one's helpful for movement. So when we have Parkinson's disease, the dopamine levels in that area are decreased and almost down to none when you finally do get diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So you have problems with initiation of movement, with controlled movements, fine motor coordination, those types of things. And then the second part is the mesolimbic and the mesocortical system. That area is also um, an area that is stimulated with dopamine, but it's from a different part of the brain. So this area is affected in Parkinson's disease, but not as much. There's still dopamine produced even when you have Parkinson's disease. And this is really important for emotions, mood, motivated behaviors. Uh, that area is the area that can really be affected with marijuana. So we have to be careful um, in some patients because they may have adverse effects when we activate the system if they still are making enough dopamine. Um, but that's why patients with Parkinson's disease can have problems with depression, anxiety, um, apathy, you know, don't want to do anything because the second part, the mesolimbic and the mesocortical system can also be decreased. And that's a little harder to treat. It doesn't respond as well to levodopa as the necrostriatal system that's good with movement. And then the third one is not as important. Um, that one is the, it's basically um, to suppress breast milk production. So it's not as important for you guys to know about. Uh, and then, so with dopamine and the endocannabinoid system, they're really linked together pretty well. The CV1 receptors are present on dopamine receptors. So our dopamine neurons uh, in the striatum in that part of the brain. So they act as a feedback mechanism and they modulate dopaminergic transmission. So they don't stimulate the dopamine manufacturing of dopamine. They don't, you know, help with, um, uh, movement or anything, but it's just a feedback mechanism to modulate it a little bit. So anandamide and 2-AG stimulate the dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens. So nucleus accumbens is a really interesting part of the brain. Um, it's important for reward and impulsive behavior. So in patients who have drug addiction, the nucleus accumbens is really, really active. Um, and it can be really important, the dopamine specifically in this part of the brain. So if you're overstimulating the nucleus accumbens, you can get addicted to things. So that's why, you know, people can get addicted to marijuana because it activates this area of the brain.
So this is a very complicated slide. So I'm gonna to try to go through it a little bit. So these, there's the two blue blobs kind of to the left of the screen. And those are dopamine receptors or dopamine neurons, I mean. So those are the neurons that are actually squirting dopamine into the brain. And that is where the endocannabinoid system or where marijuana acts on. So they act on these two receptors called GABA and glutamate. GABA is stop, glutamate is go. And so when they act on these receptors, they actually can stimulate the re release of dopamine or they can inhibit the release of dopamine depending on which receptor that you're activating. Uh, so like I said, the, the um, anandamide and the 2-AG, they're really quickly released and they're really quickly destroyed. So they don't cause a significant amount of dopamine to be released. It's just kind of modifying the amount of dopamine based on what you need the dopamine for. So your brain is constantly making sure that you have the exact right amount of dopamine in your brain when you need it and not too much. So when we talk about cannabinoids, we're talking about what is made in the marijuana plant. The two most important ones that we're interested in are THC uh, or delta tetrahydrocannabinol and then cannabidiol or CBD. So the top two ones are THC and CBD. The bottom ones are the ones that we actually make. So they look completely different from each other, right? So they don't look the same at all. So delta tetrahydrocannabinol or THC, which is, this is the one that causes high, causes people to get high, THC. So it activates the CB1 receptor really strongly. So it binds to that receptor. And the, the thing that is different from this than what we make in our own body is that it doesn't let go, right? It just sits there and sits there and sits there. And so you get this lasting effects that can last for hours. So that's why you get high with uh, activation of these receptors with THC as opposed to what our own body makes, which is very quick and then it goes away. So the problem with the marijuana that we are experiencing now or that the marijuana that is sold now, distributed now, is that the THC comp component of marijuana is so much stronger. So in the 60s, THC was only two to 3% of marijuana. Um, but now common strains have up to 8%. So that's four times as much THC. So if you smoked in your youth and now you try to go back and smoke, you're not gonna have a similar experience because the THC is just hugely different than it used to be. So it's therapeutic uses that we think um, in some patients, um, it can, what we found in some patients is that it can help with nausea and vomiting and cancer patients has been used a long time for that appetite uh, stimulation. That's really important. We've used that a long time for patients with uh, who are on chemotherapy drugs uh, so that they don't have as much nausea, vomiting so that they can have an increased appetite and actually eat. Uh, we know that it's helpful for pain. So that's something that has been used for, for a long time. And there's a lot of evidence that activating these systems helps with pain. Um, in multiple sclerosis, patients who have MS, uh, they can get a lot of muscle rigidity and spasticity, which is not the same as what we have in Parkinson's disease, but there's been some evidence that it helps with those patients with MS. And then glaucoma, which is you know the, a really common reason why people use medical marijuana. So CBD is the most common, or is the second most common uh, cannabinoid after THC. And this is, you know, everywhere now. Everybody's talking about CBD. Um, it's not psychoactive, so it does not cause the high. Um, but in some studies, marijuana containing more CBD produced a more mellow high as opposed to the ones with more THC, which produced more of a paranoid high. So I don't know how many of you have experience with marijuana, um, but nobody really wants the paranoid high. Everybody wants to experience the mellow high. So that's what CBD is for. It kind of mellows out the high. So they've extracted this from marijuana and actually are selling it you know, online. Um, down the street, there's a store that probably sells this. So it's, it's really, really um, proliferating, proliferating in our popular culture now, CBD. So it doesn't directly activate CB1 or CB2, but it may inhibit CB1 activation. So this is a little bit scientific, but basically, you know, it doesn't work exactly the way that THC does. Um, it may have some neuroprotective effects and some anti-inflammatory effects. So in animal models um, that we have 
seen um, with different types of diseases, the neuroinflammation is really decreased when, patient, when these um, animals have CBD uh, infused or eaten. Um, so that's an interesting area that's been studied. Uh, some studies have also suggested that it's helpful for anxiety and even sleep. And we've seen that in patients who just anecdotally take CBD, that it helps them go to sleep at night. And then Epidiolex, which is that uh, Charlotte's web that I was talking about in the beginning, that's been approved for epilepsy. So it's just pure CBD that these kids are taking to um, help with their specific epilepsy syndromes, uh, but it's extremely high doses. It's not stuff that you can get um, online. It's like a very, very purified high dose CBD. So there are other drugs that are derived from marijuana other than the Epidiolex. Marinol, which is just THC, uh, this has been used for a long time. So THC and medical marijuana. So medical marijuana options uh, change depending on the state that you're in. So that's the problem with this, with this, um, uh, the medical marijuana industry is that there's no regulation in the medical marijuana industry. There's no federal regulation. So we can't say go from one medical marijuana dispensary to the other and compare what they're actually giving to patients to make sure that what they're giving them is the same or that it's different, um, you know, depending on what disease they're claiming to treat, we can't really monitor this at all. So we don't know what you're actually taking. Um, THC levels may not be available to consumers. So they may be giving you a much higher dose of THC than you know about. Um, and you may not be able to request a level of THC, which is really, really important. We'll talk a little bit about that. So in medical marijuana dispensaries, the THC level may actually be up to 25% of what you're taking. So that's really, really psychoactive. So you could just go off the deep end if you take some of these. So um, in, these, in these stores, you can buy you know, edibles or you can buy hot, uh, smoke, you know, just marijuana to smoke either from a vape pen or you know, the plant itself. Smoking has the quickest onset, but a lot of people are using these edibles because they're easier to use, you know, you don't have to smoke, but the problem is that they're slow to act. So you don't know how much you've taken until it kicks in and it can take an hour plus for these things to kick in. So you may take more and more and more, and then you're just in trouble. So this is a dopamine neuron, like we talked about before, the top part is the dopamine neuron, and then the bottom part is the receptor. So when you use THC, what happens is that all the dopamine kind of gets released into the receptors and you can, that's how you get high is the dopamine is just released um, and it continues to be released in these ways. All right, well, if you're interested, you can Google mouse party. You can find out how all the different drugs work in your brain. All right, so when we talk about um, any type of drug that causes a high, we're looking at mostly dopamine release in the brain. So, and it's specifically in the area called the nucleus accumbens that we talked about that's really important for reward and impulsive behavior. So what happens with THC, and this is a, the green line is a patient who hasn't gotten any THC, any drugs at all. The, the, the dopamine level in the nucleus accumbens stays the same. So there's no high, nothing like that. You may see if you look at like microscopic levels of dopamine, if they are eating a cookie or something, you might have a little burst of dopamine. Um, or if you're watching a show that you like, maybe a little burst of dopamine and there's just rewarded behaviors. Um, but when you take a drug, what happens is that dopamine level shoots up very high. So in this slide, I don't think I can use the, uh, the laser pointer, but basically we're looking at levels of dopamine over time. So the red one is a patient who's gotten 0.5 milligrams per kilogram of THC injection. So over time, you can see um, there's a little bit of a bump. It's pretty high change um, and it lasts for a really long time. So 80 minutes, 100 minutes, 120 minutes at the end, you're still having more dopamine than the normal person. If you give one milligram per kilogram, you get this huge bump in THC and then it lasts for a really long time. So marijuana lasts for, the high lasts a long, long time. So when the THC binds to that receptor, the, it doesn't let go like we talked about. And the dopamine just kind of keeps going, going, going for a really long time. So um, in patients who use 
marijuana a lot, a lot, a lot, what happens is that that part of the brain kind of gets burned out. And so you're not making as much dopamine, you're not releasing as much dopamine unless you're smoking. And that's why patients who smoke a lot of marijuana can become apathetic in between smoking marijuana because their brain is just not making enough dopamine to stimulate rewarded or to stimulate, you know, behaviors, motivated behaviors. So we get reduced dopamine release in the strain and you get reduced dopamine synthesis. So you're just, the dopamine levels just go down over time. So like I said, the adverse effects of long-term use of marijuana can be reduced motivation, reduced activity, um, hallucinations, and schizophrenic-like psychotic disorders. So those last two are what we really are worried about when we talk about marijuana use and Parkinson's disease. We really don't want to agitate this behavior or increase this, the risk of this behavior. So that's why we're really careful about uh, when we talk to our patients about using medical marijuana. Okay, so psychosis and marijuana use is really well studied. This is not in Parkinson's disease. This is just in normal people. So more regular use is associated with worse outcomes. Um, psychosis is more common in patients who have used marijuana and especially young people. We think that it really changes the neurochemistry of their brains. Um, uh, in young people, they're 6.7 times more likely to develop schizophrenia if they've used marijuana more than 50 times. And this is when their brain is still developing. So in the teenage years up into the early 20s, if they're using marijuana quite a bit, then it changes the neurochemistry of their brain and they're more likely to get schizophrenia. Um, heavy marijuana users and schizophrenics, their brains actually have similar brain changes on MRI scans and marijuana can precipitate or kind of kick off the first psychotic break in kids who have an increased risk of developing schizophrenia. So it's not, you know, everybody thinks marijuana is like this very mellow thing. It's not a big deal, but it can be for specific groups, especially young kids. And the reason why I kind of highlighted this is because children's brains are changing, you know, they're evolving, they're changing, they're making different connections. And I think we can kind of say something similar about patients with Parkinson's disease and patients who have neurodegenerative diseases. Your brain is not the same, right? It's changing over time. And so that's why we need to be really careful about introducing new chemicals into the brain because you have a changing brain and we don't know what's gonna happen when we give a chemical that we don't know what it's gonna do. So in healthy adults, this is the same, not in patients with Parkinson's disease, but in healthy adults, marijuana can um, result in deficits in learning, working memory, and attention. These are already parts of the brain that are part of the cognitive spectrum that can be harder to use in Parkinson's disease. So if we add marijuana, we can actually cause these to be worse. Um, with abstinence, though, this can improve. And then patients with heavy marijuana use are also can be more impulsive. And that can also be a problem with Parkinson's disease. When you're adding in the dopamine, you can become more impulsive. So um, in patients with MS who are smoking marijuana, they show that they had problems with working memory and made more errors in working memory tasks. So these are patients who have brain disorders and they're using marijuana. So um, in kids, it's the same thing. We have problems with um, cognitive functioning that doesn't improve because their brains are changing. So we may, they may be doing permanent damage to their brain. Um, and then also areas of the brain related to reward and uh, can be changed permanently in kids like the nucleus accumbens. So um, this is a scientific study that was done. Sorry, it's a little bit dense, but basically the areas of the brain that are important for um, balance can also be affected with long-term marijuana use. So what's the difference between drugs and medical marijuana? I talked a little bit about this. Uh, the FDA approval process for, for medical, for medicines, it's a really lengthy process. So there's three steps that are four steps that have to be gone through before a drug can become completely approved by the FDA. So the first step is that they have to show efficacy and safety in animal models. So um, then they have to show that it's safe and healthy people. So any drug that you take, they give it to people who have just volunteered to take a drug to make sure that it's safe. So it moves specifically from animals into healthy people um, who get the drug and they make sure that it's just safe to take in general. Uh, and then you have to have multiple, what we call placebo controlled studies in patients with the disease of interest. So a placebo controlled study is basically where one group of people gets uh, the drug, one group of people gets a sugar pill, 
And the patients don't know the difference and the doctors who are performing this study don't know the difference. And that way there's no bias. There's no bias in the studies. And this is really important in Parkinson's disease because the placebo effect in Parkinson's disease can be really high. So right in the beginning of the study, in any study of Parkinson's disease, what we see is that both groups get better. And then over time, you know, over months, then there's the difference in the group. So the patients who are getting the drug, if it works, it changes their physical symptoms or their mood or whatever we're studying. Um, but in the group who's getting the sugar pill, they eventually decline back to their baseline and it no longer works. So we really need these studies, the placebo controlled studies where we can get one group who's taking it, one group who's not, and we don't know which group is which. So this can be really hard in marijuana because the group that's getting the marijuana is obviously going to feel it and the group that's not is not going to. So this is presents a challenge to us in studying these types of drugs. Um, so medical marijuana and other corporations, they've not gone through this process. So we, they don't have, there may be safety data on animals, but they haven't gone through all the rest of these things like placebo controlled trials. So that's why when we say that we don't know enough about Parkinson's disease, we don't have placebo controlled trials in Parkinson's disease patients. So why are we interested then? Well, it looks like cannabinoids, not THC specifically, but things like CBD and other compounds may have neuroprotective effects, right? So they may protect the brain from free radicals um, or protect from neurodegeneration in patients who have neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, like I said, it's not necessarily from THC, but from CBD. Um, there's other compounds called cannabinol, CP55, 940, and AM404. There's a, like I said, there's 420 chemicals in marijuana, and we only have really studied two of them. So we really have a lot more that we need to know about marijuana and what exactly we're looking at when patients consume this. So um, if you activate the CB2 receptor, which is the other receptor that's not activated by THC, um, this may cause anti-inflammatory effects. And then uh, CB1 agonists reduce excitotoxicity, which is not good for your brain. If your brain gets too excited, it can have damage to it. So, um, so we're really interested in these drugs, but we just don't have the ability to study it yet because of the federal regulation saying that marijuana does not have any medical use. So it's hard for us to study this. So how about Parkinson's disease? So in animal models, um, which are not great, our Parkinson's disease animal models are not good. And that's part of the problem with Parkinson's disease in general. Um, there's an increase in this endocannabinoid system activity. So it kind of makes sense, right? If you don't have enough dopamine, you're gonna make more of these receptors because you're really searching for any type of signal to happen. So everything in the brain is kind of made more of because it's the, there's not enough dopamine. So the rest of the brain is really hyperactively looking for the dopamine. So it's kind of upregulated. Um, animal models have shown that THC, CBD, and other cannabinoids are protective in Parkinsonism, but like I said, there's the animal models are not great in Parkinson's disease, so we don't know if this really translates well into humans. Um, but there's significant variability whether there's improvement or no change in animal models when it comes to motor spores. So if it helps with dyskinesias, if it helps with movement, if it helps with stiffness, the variability is really high in these animal models. So in people, there have been a couple of trials um, in the drugs that have already been approved, right? So we talked about Marinol and Nabilone, other medications that are FDA approved. These have really not been studied well. Um, like I said, we, we really need those placebo control trials. And all we've really had are very small trials that are just open label, which is where everybody gets the drug and we don't have a placebo control group. So whether or not these are scientifically valid or you know, applicable to the general population is really tough to say. We don't know if it's gonna help. Um, but so far, they're really plus or minus. Some say it helps, some say it doesn't. Um, they just did a study with Epidiolex, that medication uh, that was used in uh, epilepsy patients or they gave 15 Parkinson's disease patients um, high, high doses of it, the Epidiolex, and it gave 85% of them major diarrhea. So it's not, you know, maybe not the best drug for this. So let's see. So there was a recent Michael J. Fox Foundation survey 
um, they asked 1900 patients to answer these questions. And this is um, the most broad study that I found that's been done in Parkinson's disease. So more than 70% of patients who um, uh, were asked these questions said that they've used cannabis for their Parkinson's disease. Uh, the most common way was eating it once a day. About 13% of people did not know what type of cannabis they were taking. And among those who did, nearly half took higher CBD than THC, which is what we'd like to see. But, um, and then 15% took equivalent amounts of CBD and THC. Uh, many reported small improvements in pain, anxiety, agitation, or sleep. And the most common side effects were dry mouth, dizziness, memory cognitive changes. Um, patients, interestingly, the patients who said they took more THC had more side effects, but they felt better. And then 30% of patients didn't tell their doctor that they were using cannabis. So that's, that's a problem. So what's the take home of this? So basically, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Uh, we wish that we knew more information. Um, we don't know what these drugs do to, their, to our brains that are undergoing these neurodegenerative disease process, and we need more research. And just because it grows on the ground doesn't necessarily mean that it's safe. So it's a drug, it's changing the chemistry of your brain, and you just have to be safe about it. So, um, you know, it's, it's difficult in this state to get it, you know, because it's not legal. So some people are getting it from, you know, their grandkids or their kids, <laughs> they're using it. We don't know what's in that. So that might be a little tricky, but um, the take home message is that, you know, I, I'd like to work with my patients. If you're interested in trying it, I think, you know, the most important thing to know is to try to get a, a compound that has more CVD than THC. Because THC is the one that's gonna cause problems like hallucinations um, and cognitive worsening. But, the, uh, but like I said, we just, we just don't know, unfortunately. All right, and that's the end of the, of the presentation. I'm sorry if it was a little scientifically dense, <laughs> but uh, any questions? Anybody have any questions? Uh-huh. Um, um, you were talking about the, um, the CBD uh -huh. and um, the fact that it, I think you said something to the effect that it can wear itself out over long periods of time. Yes. Using it, okay. Then can you relate, does my cinnamon or my carbidopa do, levodopa do the same thing over a long period of time? No. So, yeah, so the, the, that's the difference between the cannabinoids that you're like from marijuana and the, the similar compounds that your brain makes. So anything that your brain makes is able to be degraded or like basically gotten rid of very quickly because you don't want to make a change in your brain that lasts a really long time, right? You want a signal that's going to be quick and then it's going to go away. So dopamine in the brain is degraded pretty fast, right? It's, it's gone away really quickly after the signal has been released. So in levodopa, it only lasts about four hours in most patients, four to six hours, the medication. Um, in the brain itself, it's degraded pretty fast. So the same thing with the endocannabinoids and the ones that your brain makes, they last very quickly. But the ones that you take, like CBD or THC, they last a long time. That's why they're different. So they don't, the brain has a difficult time degrading them as opposed to what you make yourself. So CBD is not psychoactively, uh, it doesn't cause hallucinations and you know high, so it's not as worrisome, but THC, if you're taking a lot of it, it can last a really long time. So I'm trying to think, okay, so my doctor, if I was taking the CBD and the Cinemat, at the same time, mm -hmm. does my doctor have to? No, because we don't know what we don't know what CBD is doing. Okay. Yeah, I mean that would be really great if we could take a look, but right now, because the federal government says that it's not, there's no medical uses, we can't really study it. You can't overdo it by taking. If my doctor's already got me, say, on two of my Cinemax three times a day, it's okay to take as much of a CBD as I feel comfortable taking? Or? At this point, probably because the CBD doesn't really act on the dopamine receptors as much. But 
like I said, we just, we don't know. We don't know. So it's really going to be your personal experience, which is hard. It's hard for me to give you advice on the medical marijuana because we just don't have any information. Uh-huh. So for the CBD where that goes uh, lots longer, would that help with taking the other medicine without going like this? Because I noticed with the medicine, it goes up and then it comes down. And yeah. You have to take more and then you can still think goes away. Yes. So the CBD would be a little cushion to keep him. See, we don't know what CBD does to dopamine or the levodopa. So we think what CBD helps with is anxiety and sleep but that doesn't have anything to do with the levodopa, right? Because people with Parkinson's are getting, they have sleep problems and anxiety problems, even when they're taking their levodopa. So this might be something we could add on top of the levodopa to help with the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. But we just don't have the information yet to say that it's going to help. But maybe I misunderstood in the beginning, did you say that CBD helps with the stiffness and the relaxing the muscles? It can in in multiple sclerosis, but there's no evidence in Parkinson's that it helps with that yet. We don't know. Yeah. Uh-huh. I apologize if, that, if this is really, really basic, but I know that Parkinson's is, that dopamine is the problem. Yes. But after today, I'm a little confused. Is it that the brain's not, is the problem with the production of dopamine or the receptors for dopamine? So it's the production of dopamine in Parkinson's disease. Yeah, you've still got the receptors, but the dopamine cells that make dopamine and then ship it off into the brain, those are dying. So that's why taking the yeah. dopamine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. So if, if there's no evidence that the CBD acts on Parkinson's, um, not yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You had a question, sir? Um, has anybody developed a, some practical laboratory tests for determining the CBD level or the THC level in the body that would be something that could use as a practical test by clinicians? Not, not yet. I mean, we have a urine drug screen that says if it's in there, <laughs> if you've taken it, right? But we don't know what levels we can't, there's no practical test to tell what levels yet. It's all scientific, right? You, we can measure it in the lab. Um, but as far as like me ordering it to see if, if you're taking CBD that you've gotten from a store, can I tell if there's actually CBD in there? I can't, I can't do that. Yeah, I don't know. So anybody else have questions? Yes. I've got another one. It sure. Similar to the one I asked. No, that's okay. My doctor recently prescribed me with Elderprill. Uh huh. And I think he did it for anxiety um, and uh, maybe fatigue. But should I be telling him if I were to take CBD, it I think what you're saying might do the same thing. Is there any harm in doing both of those at the same time, or? So the only thing with taking a new drug or adding a new drug into your regimen, either if it's an over-the-counter supplement or a medication that was prescribed to you by your doctor, you don't want to take two things at once and start them at the same time. So if you take the Eldopril, take the Eldopril and don't take the CBD. And then if you want to add the CBD later, then you can add that in and see if it helps, or you can do the CBD first and then the elder pro later, but you don't want to add them both because you don't know if one's working, if one's not working and you don't want to just take a bunch of stuff. Please know my, I do exactly what my doctor tells me to do. <laughs> and I would not be, I would not experiment with this without asking him first. Yeah. I think the important thing is just to tell your doctor, like I'm interested in this. I'd like to try it. What are your thoughts? You know, some doctors are like, absolutely not, don't take any, anything. I'm a little, unless patients are having hallucinations, then I say, absolutely not, do not take this. But if you're in earlier stages of the disease and you're interested in trying something, I don't really have a problem with it. Yeah. But it's going to be tough because it's not legal here. So it's hard to get. It's not, not legal for medical purposes. No, it's not legal for medical purposes in North Carolina yet. But didn't you say that 
you've worked with patients of maybe another state? I worked in Illinois before I came here, and it's legal for both recreational and uh, medical purposes. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's it's a little trickier. <laughs> a lot of my patients have said that their kids or their grandkids have gotten them marijuana to try, which is, you know, a little iffy. <laughs> Any other questions? So if you decide that you want to take it, just let your doctors know, that's all. Because if you all of a sudden start having side effects and we don't know what you're taking, it's hard for us to kind of manage your treatment. So just let us know what you've decided to take. You know, if, if what your doctor makes you feel bad about it, you know, it's your choice, it's your body. If you want to put something in your body, that's your choice. That's how I feel about it. Right. So I can only make you aware of the possible side effects, possible benefits, or, you know, just aware that I don't know what's going to happen if you take it and we can have a discussion, but if you keep it from your doctors, then we just don't know. And then we can't help you if something happens. Did you want to say something? You said something about the youth, the young folks. That yeah. Use weed or actually anyone can become addictive. Yes. Yeah, it can. It's, it's less addicting than let's say like narcotics or cocaine or something like that. Uh, but it's it, addicting because you miss the benefit and then you're addicted to meeting that the need based. Addiction. Yeah. I marijuana takes a longer time to get addicted to. And the reason the way that I understand it is that your brain stops making as much dopamine to kind of counteract the effect that you're getting from smoking weed all the time. Because when you smoke weed, your brain is releasing a lot of dopamine. So your brain says, okay, I don't need to make as much because I'm releasing so much. So it backs off on the amount that you're making. And so when you're not smoking marijuana, you feel bad, right? You feel down, you feel depressed, you're not motivated. And so you want to smoke it more. And that change because of the being younger, the brain is a lot more adaptive. It changes a lot faster. So it can be addictive in that way. But it's not like you're going to have significant withdrawals or you're going to get sick, like with, you know, narcotics or anything like that. It's not that type of addiction. Do we have any questions from the, the Zoom? No. I don't see any either. No. Thank you, Dr. Bain. Yeah, of course.